So welcome to Communicating Science to Solve Tough Challenges Week 1. I'm Shiva Ozma. I've been corresponding with many of you, and I'm really excited to be able to teach you a lot of the things that you cannot learn as a scientist that I've gotten from 10 years of working outside on the job experience as a writer, communicator, etc. So let's get started. So here's what you'll learn in this 12 session course. What is science communication or it's also often called SciComm. Um, it's also called like science engagement and outreach in some circles. We'll talk about how SciComm benefits science. Pursuing SciComm as part of science where sociology and policy fit in with SciComm which we don't usually think of science as being a social activity but there's a lot of overlap there. Ways to solve problems with SciComm and finally SciComm ethics. So first, before we got started, before we get started in this, this 12 week course, I wanted to point out 12 session course, technically 24, 24 ish weeks. Um, Fancy Comet LLC has a number of SciComm resources. We have a blog, we post every week. We have a YouTube, which I post videos often. Um, we have a social, we have social media, we have LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, we have a Substack newsletter. We talk about different aspects of science communications and policy and marketing once a month. And you can find all of those at the top of our site here. I've got, I've showed you the top of our site and I circled the blog thing and also our social media handles. So you can follow us there so that you, um, and these are all free resources. So you don't have to pay money for them. They just arrive on your social media timelines and in your inbox. So, I wanted to start off talking about how to use the Fancy Comma website to keep up to date about SciComm for free. So here's our website. You probably have been to our website. Um, if you go to the blog tab, you can click on blog and then it has a different, I, it's, it's separated into different tabs. So it has, you can click on the, the blog and you can read all of the blog posts or you can go to only the writing ones or science communication, marketing policy. We talk about a lot of different things that are adjacent to science. So if you click on the learn tab at the top of our website, you can see our get into SciComm and SciPol resources. I wrote a seven part guide about working in politics as a scientist. We have books, resources for writers and entrepreneurs that aren't specific to scientists. And we have some guides on SEO and interpreting statistics. So this is our resources page. Um, if you go to the, re if you click on, it's from the, it's in the get into SciComm and SciPol, or if you go to this URL, you can find our writing, marketing, journalism, and policy resources. So that was a quick aside, but, um, but the pr purpose of this lecture is talk talking about SciComm. So what is SciComm anyway? Hopefully many of you already know about SciComm is short for science communication and scientists already communicate daily in their jobs. They do things, they write grants and papers, they talk to other scientists, they talk to the public, they talk to the meeting, me they talk to the media. So why aren't they getting training in communications? That's the question that I have now after working in communications as a scientist and seeing all of the sort of places where scientists could communicate better. So the first reason is money. Teaching science communication means hiring outside people or paying professors more to teach an extra class. And there's not money for that in the existing grant landscape because people spend all their time and money just working to get more data, to apply for more grants so they can do more science. And that's the only way they can basically get funding. However, SciComm is an investment that pays off. So think about what the world would look like if scientists were better able to converse with society. Um, there would be more social issues that would get attention. There would be reduced gatekeeping in academia because people could actually have conversations where they were on the same page and they would actually be talking about the issues and they could communicate effectively without having all of these weird issues that happen in academia, like people, scientists complaining that the media doesn't understand their, their science or they overstate their science. If you can be part of creating the message, then it will, that, that will help the messaging a lot. From, from a communication standpoint. And then the other thing is people would feel more trust towards scientists. So there would be more, um, people would be able to understand scientists better and they would be tr they would find trying to scientists more trustworthy, more relatable. It might break down some of those stereotypes of the scientist as like this old white guy that is just constantly doing science. Because if you look at who's at, who are the scientists, their act scientists are actually more diverse than people realize. And so, um, and being relatable is a really good 
aspect in science because it's good to be relate more relatable than it is to not be relatable. So, um, and people find connection with people that have similar identities to them. So marginalized scientists can play a role in helping other people from their communities learn more about science. So science would be a larger part of society at large if scientists were better able to converse with society. Oops. So the second reason that science communication isn't a huge part of science curriculum is time. And that's because scientists work a lot. The hustle, hustle culture of science is real. I follow a number of graduate student sort of like science influencers on Instagram and um, they're constantly working. Like they're working like 12 hour days and they're doing the projects that their advisors have to do, the postdocs, because you know, the hierarchical training of science, hierarchical structure of science, it's like, it's like the bottom you have the interns, in the middle you have sort of like the college students, then you have the undergrad, the graduate students, college students are undergrads, then you have the graduate students, then you have the postdocs, then you have the PI. So there's, if you're lower on the totem pole, you get different projects from several of the people above you. So, and scientists complain that there's not enough time to do this kind of work. Um, but ideally science communication training would be part of undergraduate and even high school science, but it's not built in. And for the most part, adding an extra course to that could take away from the already scarce time to teach and study science. These are the reasons that I feel that science communication shouldn't be taught, but these are the kind of, these are the stumbling blocks, the reasons that, they, that it's not taught on any large scale. And then the third reason is that scientists don't really regard this as, for by and large, the scientific enterprise doesn't regard science communication as an important part of training. Professors have a lot to do. They don't want to do SciComm. Many fields, like if you get into the more technical fields, they don't regard science communication or communication in general as important. They see it as fluff. In graduate schools, training grants don't require it and they consider it to be something tangential, such as like quote unquote outreach, which is kind of like outreach is when you go to like middle school students and you tell them about how great science is. And that involves communicating science on some level, but it's sort of, one of those things that you do when you want to feel like you're a good person. So there are many reasons to teach and learn science communication and here are just three. So one reason is to help students be better, better able to communicate. So clarity of writing is clarity of thought. The other reason is to improve pedagogical learning. So you can learn about science by writing about it. So one quote that I really like about writing and I, and I, I typed it from memory here so hopefully it's not it's paraphrased, you can count that as a paraphrase, but Flannery O'Connor once wrote, I write to learn what I know. So writing about something can help you know more about it. So that can be like, if you're scientists that are trying to teach science, they can use science communication as a um, medium to teach science. And then the last reason, which is really important, and we never talk about this, is to bridge the gap between science and fields such as journalism and law, which are steeped in humanities traditions. So I don't know how much you know about the Supreme Court here in the US, but the cases that have been decided by our courts recently have involved in vitro fertilization, which is a basically a lab technique, and the social media algorithms are also going to be decided upon by the Supreme Court. So there's no, um, there's no real interface there between science and these humanities-based traditions because the, the one way that scientists could influence and tech people could influence the Supreme Court decisions is by submitting briefings as like a friend of the court or like submit an amicus brief. But there's no, um, there's no science built into that. And I, and I think part of that is because those are their separate fields. But another part is that science doesn't um, conveniently interface with those other fields. So we're about halfway done. Well, let's see what we have next. Okay, so next I wanna tell you a little bit about the different types of science communication. So there's, when you think about scientists, they can communicate with to themselves, within themselves, and they can communicate outside of science. So inward facing SciComm is scientists communicating to themselves. Grants, writing journal papers, giving presentations at conferences, journal clubs, 
all of that kind of stuff. That's all science communication that actually scientists are doing every day among themselves. Then there's the other type of science communication and it's called, Sam Illingworth has, called, has created these, this dichotomy of like inward facing versus outward facing. So outward facing psychom goes outside of science. So that involves writing blog and a lot of times scientists don't do this work, but it would be good if they could have communication skills so that they don't, they could make this process easier of communicating science outside of science. So that's like stuff like writing blogs and press releases, talking to the media, creating an internet presence, science policy and engaging in science advocacy and talking to scientists in different fields. So those are two, the main breakdown of science communication. So now there's another aspect of science communication which relates to journalism. So science communication is about helping people understand science often to reach a larger goal, to get them to do something or to understand something. Science journalism is a subset of journalism. It's not really about science communication, but it's like more journalism that involves science. Journalism is defined as the activity of gathering, assessing, creating, and presenting news and information. It is also the product of these activities. So while science journalism involves elements of science communication, like communicating scientific information, it's not like an explainer on something scientific. Usually the science that's explained in science journalism pieces is part of a larger puzzle to get people to understand an issue or why it matters to them. So these are all the places that science can play a role. And here we are as scientists with not getting any training to do any of this work and not even really thinking about it. So here's a bunch of jobs involving science communication. Obviously a science scientist, all levels, whether you're consider yourself a scientist and you're doing undergrad research or you're a professor of science somewhere, being a science teacher or professor obviously involves communicating science. Working in science policy involves science. Um, being a science writer involves science, science journalism, being a grant reviewer or administrator, being a project manager, the list goes on. And some of these are straight up science jobs and some of them aren't straight up science jobs. They're actually like working in science policy or actually a policy professional or working as a science teacher, you're actually working in the education field. As a science journalist, you're technically a journalist. So the scientific piece comes from, there's, there's the need to understand the science, but then there's also the need to do these, the communications aspects and all of that. And that's where SciComm comes in. So again, I'm kind of belaboring this point, but why do scientists and engineers need to know about SciComm? Both scientists and engineers need to be able to communicate their work both to others in their field and to people who have no knowledge of their field. And science communication makes science more effective and impactful. The pandemic has highlighted the need for SciComm and effective SciComm can help tackle ignorance and misinformation. So when I was an undergraduate at MIT from 2001 to 2005, we had a communications requirement and we did learn a little bit about communicating science. And I also served on this subcommittee on the communications requirement that was basically making this, this um, requirement possible and doing the assessments to see what are students truly learning. And one of the reasons for this communications requirement was posted on the MIT website and it said, students regardless of their field of study should learn to write prose that is clear, organized and effective and to marshal facts and ideas into convincing written and oral presentations. So that's just because regardless of whether you go into a communications field as a scientist, which is relatively rare or more likely you go into something in your field doing science or engineering, you will definitely have to communicate what you do. And if you can't communicate what you do, people will start to question its impact. And you might realize, you might see that you don't get as much done as you would like if you could have communicated it better. <laughs> 